Well, friends, we've been in a series, the Sermon on the Mount, and it's going to be 12 weeks total. So we've passed the halfway point. And I said, one of the things that I love about this is we get to go slow. But one of the dangers of going slow is that we lose sight of the whole message. We lose sight of the context and the things that are being repeated from week to week to week as we zoom in every week. And so remember, Jesus is talking to these people, and he gathered especially his own disciples, and he begins by saying, you are blessed in the kingdom of God. What he's doing is inviting them to live in and receive the inheritance that we have as sons and daughters of the king, believing that Jesus reigns. Will you say with me this morning, church? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord, right? Jesus is Lord. And so we're talking about this kingdom that he reigns over as a good and sovereign king. And he wants us to experience life in the kingdom. We talk about it all the time as life abundant, this life in the kingdom. But he's also calling us to be people who represent the will of God and the righteousness of God. This has been an ongoing theme that we've talked about. He's redefining righteousness for them. He's talking primarily to a group of Jews who understood righteousness as it had been taught and modeled to them by the scribes and the Pharisees. Last week, Pastor Thad began this section of the teaching that we basically are continuing on. So Thad talked with us about the beginning of Matthew 6, this idea about how you give. Jesus is talking to Jews. They already know that part of their religious practice is to give, but he wants to talk to them about how they give. And Thad was telling us, remember, that we don't give to get something, right? We don't give to get. Our reward, he told us, is freedom. We have freedom from our stuff and from our money when we give generously and when we understand the kind of heart of God and what that righteousness looks like. So he started us in this path talking about righteousness. We see it in Matthew 6, verse 1. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others. So he's been redefining righteousness, saying, you have heard it said, but I said to you. Now he's got another thing he needs to teach us about this righteousness or holiness before God. Do not be doing it to be seen by others. And this idea of a reward, there's a scholar named Ralph Earl, a Bible scholar. He wrote that one test of a man's consecration is whether he's willing to do something for God, regardless of who gets the credit. This is the kind of holiness and righteousness that Jesus wants us to understand. And he starts with the spiritual discipline of giving. It's a practice. He says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the the needy, do not announce it with trumpets. So it actually occurred that people, if they were going to give alms to the poor, would blow a trumpet to announce it. Like, hey, everybody, come on, I'm about to give away money or things that you need, right? So this isn't just a a figurative. This was sometimes literal. Do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. So you are already starting to hear what we would call key words, repeated words. And whenever we see words repeated over and over again, we should be paying attention because that means it's the theme of what he's trying to tell us, what he's trying to have us understand about life in the kingdom. And so listen for the repeated words as I continue on in Matthew 6, verse 5. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. 
And when you pray, do not keep babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. When you fast, don't look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head, wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. So one of the phrases that's repeated over and over again here is the idea of our reward. What is our reward? And he's talking about these spiritual disciplines, giving, praying, and fasting, right? These are things that we are saying as a church we should be engaged in all the time. These are some of the seven rhythms that I just preached through in May and June. This is what helps us grow up in our Christ-likeness and helps us glorify God. These are disciplines that are to be done, but how are we doing them? What's the reward that we're looking for? They're not meant to be a checklist so that we can feel self-righteous. They're not meant to be subjected to a performance evaluation by our peers. These things are to be done in the context of an abiding relationship with God where we are refined and sanctified. It's not a performance of religion. So remember when Jesus said to them in Matthew 5, 21, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the scribes, you're not gonna enter heaven. This was hyperbole, so they would think differently about what they've seen from the religious leaders. It's not a performance of religion. And this idea that the reward is different, we see it three times. First with giving in Matthew 6, 2. When you give to the needy, don't announce it. Um, as the hypocrites do on the streets and in the synagogues to be honored because, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. If you have your Bibles, underline. They have received their reward in full. Matthew 6, 5. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the corners to be seen by others. Truly, they have received their reward in full. And then finally, with fasting, in verse 16, when you fast, don't look somber, don't disfigure yourself, for they want to show others that they're fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. What is he trying to get us to understand? Well, I love thinking about this word reward in the Greek. It was also a way that they would have associated with a receipt. There's um, the Wesleyan Bible commentary says it this way, the papyri, the, the manuscripts that we have, have shown that the verb here is the regular form used in receipts of that day. What Jesus is saying is this, if people do their religious acts to gain the praise of men, They've already been given a receipt, paid in full. And they thereby have no claim on a reward in the next life. One must decide whether he puts higher value on an earthly or a heavenly reward. And I want to remind you, we keep saying it. For us who are already adopted and considered sons and daughters in the kingdom, who acknowledge Jesus as Lord, the kingdom of heaven is already so even what he's saying here, like you must decide, do you care about the earthly or the heavenly? It doesn't mean choose, are you going to have a reward now or after you die? It means when you live this way, that you already get to experience parts of this inheritance. We won't experience it in full until Jesus returns 
and defeats all sin and evil, and, and we get to live in a new kingdom. We won't experience it in full, but we get to experience it today. We get to experience it today. I love in places, like in 2 Corinthians 13, one of the blessings that Paul writes. He says, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We get to experience those today, friends. This is the inheritance that we have as sons and daughters in the king's kingdom, where he rules and reigns. And so when we think about the reward, rather than receiving this receipt from people who can see us and hear us, paid in full, or rather than checking off a checklist where we feel self-righteous and proud of ourselves, we need to remember that the reward is God himself. He has given you his very self. He gave on the cross. He gave the Holy Spirit. He has given us this ability to be in abiding relationship with him. All his love, all his grace, all his peace, he is giving it to us. Do you want to receive that? So we remember that the reward is God himself. And so Jesus is saying, don't settle for these cheap rewards from the praise of men or your own feeling of self-righteousness. Instead, the reward is God himself. And so rather than standing on the street corner, when you pray, this is verse 6, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. A lot about being seen and heard, but God always sees you. He is El Roy. And so some of you probably have like a literal prayer closet, this secret place where you go to pray. Jesus is making a contrast here. You know, those things are good. There are places for us to get away with the Father as Jesus did. But what he's really wanting us to understand is the contrast between standing on a street corner and praying where nobody's going to see you or hear you or give you credit. The Father is the one. He is the reward, right? And so when we look at how people are trying to be seen, trying to be heard, trying to have people acknowledge their righteousness or feel self-righteous, we need to ask ourselves, with a discipline, a practice like prayer, are we posturing or are we pursuing God? If God himself is the reward, prayer is not about posturing, not even trying to convince God <laughs> that he should be listening to you. It's about a pursuit of someone that we love dearly. So is prayer something that feels like you're just posturing and pretending either to be seen or to convince yourself that you're okay? Or are you entering into prayer as a pursuit of a God who loves you? A God who has everything you need. He goes on and he says in verse 8, Do not be like them, right? He was talking about the pagans. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. And then Jesus gives a model for prayer. So if you're new to the church, this is a prayer that has been prayed historically and we pray it with these words. But it's also a model for prayer to give us an idea of the heart behind prayer. So he says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. These words that Jesus speaks, they come in the context of him saying, your heavenly father already knows what you need. He sees you and he knows. You don't need to stand up in front of other people or have other people hear you. What you need to remember is that God himself is with you. He is the reward. He sees you and he knows, but he wants you to pursue him. And there are these um, concepts that we call imminence, meaning close, closeness of God, 
right? He sees you. He knows you. He wants to be intimate. He's offered you abiding relationship and communion, right? This is the imminence of God. And then the transcendence of God is that he is over all, through all, in all, right? He is sovereign. And so when we are seeking God, when we are pursuing him as the reward, we get to remember that this God who is over all and through all and in all, who is the creator of all things, he's also close to you. He's close to me. And we get to pray with a different heart and trust. So here's the second question. When you enter into prayer, are you asking your father or persuading a stranger? Do you know God this way? Do you know the character of God? Do you know the closeness of God? Because if you seek it, you will find it. He wants that intimate relationship with you. He wants you to be filled with his love, with his spirit that enables you to access all of these things that are part of your inheritance, right? Are you asking your father or persuading a stranger? I was remembering at one point, I said college in first service, but it was actually grad school. I had a job that was um, a couple hours away from where I lived working for a private school, and I would commute back and forth a bunch. At that point, Dave and I were engaged, um, but he was somewhere even farther away. So there was an accident, I got stranded on the side of the road, and what I really wanted to do was call my dad, but he was two hours away. And I thought, this is, that's ridiculous. I, I have to have help before then. And so I had a new sympathy for people on the side of the road that need the help of a stranger. But you know that feeling of like, I just wish I could call someone that I know and I trust. Someone that I know will be there. Someone that I know has my back. Someone that I know I can look to for what I need in this moment. When you know your heavenly father like that, you pray differently. You're not trying to flag a stranger down on the side of the road who may or may not care about you. You have a heavenly father who knows you, he sees you, he cares, and he has the power to do something about it. Amen? So he prays this model of prayer, and then in this sermon in this teaching he says for if you forgive other people when they sin against you your heavenly father will also forgive you but if you do not forgive others their sins your father will not forgive your sins it's kind of like where we go wait a minute whoa um, we do not believe that the gospel is about us earning our salvation right i, I hope i hear an amen right the gospel is that Jesus, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, offered himself as an atoning sacrifice for our sin, right? Was crucified, buried, resurrected to new life. This is the truth of the gospel. Now rules and reigns. So what is Jesus doing here, right? You're not forgiven because you do the right work. So all through this sermon, I've been saying, remember, sometimes Jesus uses some hyperbole. Jesus uses certain ways to talk about things so that it makes us think. You know what another key word in this passage is? Besides see and hear and besides reward, one of the key words in this passage is hypocrites. What he's telling them is, don't be a hypocrite. Forgiven people become forgiving people. If you are forgiven by the grace and mercy of God, then to live this life in the kingdom, you become a forgiving person. We are transformed that way. So he forgives us and reconciles, and he wants us to pursue forgiveness. Sometimes reconciliation for us may or may not be possible, but we need to live again. What we get, the reward, is freedom in Christ forgiveness. Then he moves to the discipline of fasting. Verse 16, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. So they might have put dirt on their face. They might have like messed up their hair. 
and gone out that way on purpose. So everyone would know how much you're suffering, right? There have been times when I have engaged in fasting with friends, and we do moan to each other. Uh, but what Jesus is saying is that what you are doing in this discipline is seeking me, knowing your need for me, remembering me, right? I am the bread of life. And so this spiritual discipline is for the Father himself, right? God himself is the reward. So he says, when you fast, put oil on your head, wash your face so that it won't be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you, right? It's not about these words to be seen over and over again. God knows he is the one who created us with this deep need to be seen and known by him first. He did create you with that need, but we so often try to fulfill that need with other humans, right? And it has to be God first, and then we create communities of transformed people where we can see each other and know each other and love each other the way Jesus does. So he's saying that this prayer and this fasting, right, the reward is God himself. God himself. Julian of Norwick was um, a saint in the Middle Ages. And when I read her stories, I think about Anna, the prophetess in the Bible, who lived her whole life praying in the temple. That's what Julian chose to do. They used to actually build what they called a cell onto the outside of a church, and she stayed there her whole life praying. And there was a window where people could bring her food. She also could be part of the church's um, presentation of charity to others. People could come for prayer. She spent a life devoted to prayer, to this intimate relationship with God. The book that she wrote was Revelations of Divine Love. She realized that this pursuit of God himself, this reward, it was about the love of God that she experienced in deep and powerful ways. She said this, the fruit and end of our prayers is that we be one and like to our Lord in all things, in union with God, that we be one with God. He is the reward, friends. And when we pray this way, really pursuing him and believing him to be this good, loving father, then we get to be like him. We get to become like him, and other people see that reflected in his people Remember, this wanting with God and becoming like him, it's the same as saying the reward is God himself. And so we have been saying as a church for some years now that prayer, it's not just something we want to talk about. It's not just something I want you to read books about. We have to be actively practicing this kind of prayer, seeking God together, right? Not for the sake of others to hear me or to see me or for me to feel self-righteous, but really pursuing God, really believing that in this prayer we get to receive more of him in our lives. And so in the Rooted experience, which is going to be happening again this fall, if you haven't done Rooted, I encourage you to do it. It's a place where we don't just talk about things, we actually do them. That's what a follower does, right? We don't keep learning more information, we actually do the things that Jesus did and told us to do. And so a prayer experience is one of those things. I want to remind you, if you've been through this before, if you have any kind of a group, we need to set time aside to pursue God. God who is the reward, his love, the fellowship of the Spirit, his grace, right? And so in the notes, on the app, on the website, there are places where we've linked the outline or what you can follow for a prayer experience. If you haven't been doing them, can I encourage you to pursue God together? Get some friends, call some people together if you don't have a group, and we need to be pursuing God this way. And so in the Rooted experience, there's one of many 
acronyms that can help you guide prayer. And sometimes, you know, I get distracted. Anyone else get distracted while praying for a while? So having something to give you focus and kind of an outline, a guide, is helpful. So in Rooted, you use P-R-A-Y, which is praise, um, repent, ask, and yield. Praise, repent, ask, and yield. So today, I don't want to just stand here and talk at you about prayer. We're going to take some time to pray. And we're going to pray this way. The worship team's coming out. The altar is open. This is a time to pursue God himself. And so I'm going to pray out loud a prayer of praise, a prayer of repentance, an asking prayer, and a yielding prayer. And in between each one, I'm leaving time and space for you to praise, for you to repent, for you to ask, for you to yield. And then we're going to have a worship song. You may have noticed we only did two at the front. Then we're going to have a time of worship. Take whatever posture you need, but do not, do not neglect the Holy Spirit's prompting to come close, pursue God himself as the reward of our faith. So I'm going to read, and then there's just going to be some instrumental time of silence, and then I'll read another one, and then we'll move into the full song. Prayer of praise. Father, you are the King of kings. I adore you in the beauty of holiness. Jesus, you are the victorious, suffering Savior. I welcome your presence. Holy Spirit, you are my comforter and truth teller, teaching me how to live with bold kingdom love. Spend some time praising him. Repentance. Lord, I repent of the ways that I forget that you are both sovereign and good. Forgive me for my sins and focusing on my own kingdom instead of yours. Lord, don't let me be critical, controlling, unloving, or trapped in a prison of bitterness or anger. Help me to quickly forgive others and find freedom there. Search our hearts, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would give me the simple faith to believe that you care about my daily bread, my sins, and my temptations. I ask you to deliver me from evil and expand my heart to forgive. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in my life today. Bring them your other requests this morning.
we surrender and yield ourselves. Father, we pray the dangerous, daring prayer, your kingdom come. I ask you to stir my heart to know your holiness. I long for the power and life of your kingdom to be known in my community. Give me the forgiveness only you can offer. Deliver me from evil. Show me your glory. And spend some time in surrender before your father.